Out of respect for the words and works of Jesus, please stand for the gospel lesson. The gospel recorded in John chapter 13, verses 21 to 30. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and, and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. This is our text. Please be seated. What does it take to be a traitor? Consider the case of Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold was a valiant fighter for the American Revolution. Under his leadership, he won two important victories early in the Revolution. He was wounded twice in battle. But we remember Benedict Arnold not as an American hero, but as an American villain. We remember him as a traitor. See, what happened is Benedict Arnold was passed over for a promotion. And because he wanted to keep up his lavish lifestyle, he wanted a lot more money. And so he came up with a scheme, and that scheme was to hand over the fort at West Point to the British, to hand that fort over with its 3,000 soldiers for 20,000 sterling, which is about a million dollars in today's money. He was able to get George Washington to appoint him commander of West Point, but before he could hand the fort over, the plot was discovered. Benedict Arnold was found out. Before they could capture him, he fled and ended up fighting for the British the rest of the war. King David knew something about betrayal. Much like Benedict Arnold, one of his close advisors, a man named Ahithophel, he was part of his, you might call it his cabinet. He was a, a close counselor, a good friend. He ate at the king's table. But when Absalom, the king's son, tried to mount a coup and take over the throne from his father David, Ahithophel betrayed David and supported Absalom. And just to imagine how hurt that must have been how hurt David must have felt from that. What a, what a pain. What, what, what a terrible thing that was to him. It was probably about Ahithophel that David was writing in Psalm 41 when he said, Even my close friend, someone I trusted, who shared my bread, has turned against me. Is there anything more biting than betrayal. A friend, someone close to you, turns on you. They, they betray your, your inmost secrets. That hurts. Nothing burns like betrayal. Judas, in many ways, was like Ahithophel. He was 
close to Jesus. He was one of the 12. He was entrusted with an office. He was the treasurer of the group. He ate at Jesus' table. But just like Ahithophel, he raised hands of betrayal. But Jesus knew this would happen. Before our text, Jesus told his disciples, I am telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. After the fact, the disciples would then remember what Jesus said. They would remember that Jesus predicted this. They would remember that Jesus knew this was all going to happen. They would remember that Jesus had all this under his control in this show that he had definitely was God. And who else but God would understand that Psalm 41 was a prophecy about Judas' betrayal of Jesus. So we see Jesus, even in the midst of betrayal, thinking about his disciples and how he can use this to strengthen their faith. But in order to strengthen their faith, he also had to make them face their own sinfulness. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. When you pull your chair up to the Thanksgiving table, it's, it's kind of unwritten rule that you leave your baggage behind, right? It's a Thanksgiving feast. It's time for joy. Mom and Dad don't argue or at least we hope not, at Thanksgiving table. Kids are less snarky, at least we hope so, at the Thanksgiving table. Well, here we have Jesus and his disciples celebrating the Passover, a festival, a good time to, uh, a celebration of God's deliverance of the people of Israel out of Egypt, a Thanksgiving feast. And what does Jesus do? He talks about betrayal and how that must have brought tension to that room. Not just because there was defensiveness about it, but because they didn't know who Jesus was talking about. One of you will betray me, Jesus said. And that sent the disciples' minds racing in wonder. Who is he talking about? Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? Could it be me? Could I really do this? They knew that Jesus is God. And as God, he knows all things. He knows what is in their hearts. And so they wondered, could Jesus really see that in me? They understood what the Apostle Paul understood about himself. He wrote in his letter to the Romans, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. And because of that, Paul warned the Corinthians, and he warns all of us, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. What secret sin is hiding in your heart? What secret sin that nobody else knows about but Satan uses to get to you? What sin is hidden in your heart? What sin is there unrepented and unchecked, eating away at your faith, corrupting your soul? Have you betrayed your God for money? Is it greed that is in your heart or, or lust or something else? This is a question we cannot ignore. We cannot just go away tonight saying, well, that Judas was sure a bad guy. We need to see the sin in our hearts. We need to understand that we are sinners, and as sinners, we sin. As sinners, we are capable of any sin. 
That's what Jesus wanted his disciples to understand that night. He was helping them grow in their faith by understanding their sinfulness, and he wants us to do the same. But Jesus wasn't just trying to help the disciples. He also wanted to warn Judas. Three times in his gospel, John says that Jesus was troubled in spirit. The first time was when he was standing at the grave of Lazarus. The last time, the third time, was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he faced bearing the sins of the world, going to the cross and carrying all hell for all sins. But the third time was right here in the upper room. As he faced Judas, he was troubled in spirit, not because he was being betrayed, but because of what he saw in Judas, because of what he saw in his heart and in his destiny. Judas didn't just get up one day and say, well, I got nothing else to do. I guess I'll betray Jesus. Well, this came because he got wrapped up in sin. Love of money took over his heart to such a degree that he was robbing from the group, from the 12. He was the, the bearer of the money bag, and it says, Scripture tells us that he was stealing from that. There's a guy stealing from his own friends, and so it's really not that much of a leap when Satan whispers into his ear, hey, what would you do for 30 pieces of silver? That sin unrepented and unchecked, brought his hands of betrayal to the table. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. What an incredible moment this is. You would think, wouldn't you, that Jesus and Judas must have locked eyes, at least for a second. And Judas had to understand that Jesus knew. Jesus knew that Judas didn't believe in him. Jesus knew the plot that Judas was involved in. Jesus, Jesus knew what Judas was about to do that night. Judas had to understand that, and yet he accepted that piece of bread, sealing his doom. And nothing scares me more than Judas. Judas scares me because of me. If Judas could do that, so can I. Because there is a traitor in me. There is a Benedict Arnold, a Judas in my heart, who wants nothing less than to take over my heart, to take over my life, to take over my eternity. And it's so easy to let him do that. And that's why it's so important for us to be in God's word, to see the seriousness of sin, to see the nature of sin, to see the consequences of sin. May we be able to see the darkness that is in our own hearts. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. It was night in the soul of Judas. It was the night when evil reigned. It was the night when the light of the world was snuffed out in death. It was night when Judas went ahead with his betrayal and betrayed Jesus with a kiss 
starting him on that path to the cross. And there at the cross, Jesus would endure even worse betrayal, not from a friend, not from a disciple, not from countrymen, but from his own father. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God treated Jesus as if he were Judas. God treated Jesus as the betrayer. God put all of Judas' sins on Jesus and all of our sins, our self-righteousness and pride, our greed and our lust. And yes, those sins we still hide from everybody else that nobody else knows. All of those sins were placed on Jesus and he paid for each and every one of them all. As Isaiah said, by his wounds, we are healed. The hands of betrayal started Jesus on the road to the cross. But that betrayal tells us that God will never betray us. God will never betray us to our sins. God will never betray us in times of struggle and difficulty. God will not betray us on Judgment Day because he has already betrayed Jesus in our place. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Amen.